It's bumping into my beard. <coughs> How are you? السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Welcome brothers and sisters Tonight inshallah I want to talk to you about measuring success We're going to go through defining what success is What is the Islamic perspective What does Islam say about how to develop success in our life What are the measures and what are the advices so this evening, insha'Allah, I'm going to give you a brief fundamental to them all, like one, two, three, four, and I'm going to divide them, each category into four, four by four by four, like that, four different topics un and under them four different fundamentals and rules. Now, I'm not going to mention everything about success, but I think the things that are most important on top of the list that experts have counted. Now, brothers and sisters, before I begin, insha'Allah, I've actually compiled a good nice list of rules and fundamentals about how each and every one of us as Muslims can be successful in this life and in the hereafter. Wallahi, they are amazing advices that I gathered from experts all around the world, but I made sure that they are also scholars in Islam and they are experts in the other fields. Three of the main ones that I used so that you know that the credibility is there and the qualification is there, inshallah, because I myself had to learn more and I attended PDs in these sessions. I attended, I attended many, many PDs in my life, which means personal development and workshops and courses. Uh, I did psychology myself and we studied management and a little bit of uh, organizational skills and law, a little bit of business. But these, there are three main experts and scholars that I took a lot of information from, and inshallah tonight I'll share it with you. The first one is Dr. Yasser al Husaymi. He's a new uh, person out there on social media. He's a scholar, an author in human development, and a psychotherapist. That's one. The second one was Professor Tariq al Habib, who is also a psychiatrist consultant and the secretary of the Federation of Arab Psychiatrists. The reason I chose Arab is because you'll understand when I talk about the mindset of Muslims in the world. And I know we're not all Arabs, but since the Qur'an is in Arabic and Islam came uh, in the Arabic language from the Arabic Prophet sallam, along the ways, we learned some Arabic culture and some mindsets that I need to address at the moment, which I think some of them may stand in the way of our success over time. And I'll, I will explain, inshallah. And the third one who is the most important, he is uh, Dr. Tariq Swaydan, who is an author and an expert in management business. He's a business entrepreneur. An, uh, an educator and a historian, and is also a chemical engineer who was listed among the 500 most influential Muslims in 2022. You may not agree with all of his ideas and his uh, opinions, but definitely in the area of management skills and building yourself and success, he, these three people are amazing, amazing, mashallah. So here it goes. First of all, brothers and sisters, before we can talk about measuring success, we need to know what is success. Everybody gives a different definition of it. And the majority of people these days, without religion, without Islam, for example, without a religion or faith of some sort, especially Islam, people usually talk about success in what? What do you think? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Money. Money is the first thing. Everybody measures their success based on how much money they get. And subhanAllah, this is quite the opposite. Money, even in the non-Muslim world, you don't even have to be a Muslim to understand this or a follower of a faith, to know that that is a ridiculous goal and a ridiculous objective. Uh, money even by the people who have all the money, they'll tell you money is not the goal. 
How many of them made money and they lost their family, they lost their parents, they lost their children, they lost the love and the connection. They ended up in homes by themselves, dying alone with nobody around them. Their hearts were cold and everything is still just money. And then they leave it all behind and someone else inherits it. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, Oh, the son of Adam, if you give him or her a valley of gold, valley between two mountains, filled with gold, he or she will take it and then would wish for another valley of gold, a second one. They'll take, he'll take it a second and a third one he'd want. And when he reaches a third, he'll set a fourth gold. He'd want a, a fourth valley of gold. Why? Just for the sake of it, because it's fun. Make more goals, reach them, but money and gold. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, and in the end, nothing fills the children of Adam's mouth except soil. He goes into this little hole in the ground, which is a grave wrapped up in this very cheap material while his body decays and takes nothing of that wealth behind him except everybody takes it and fights over it, subhanAllah. Families divide over inheritance and the money doesn't follow him or her, subhanAllah. Brothers and sisters, money therefore is not the goal. And when we look at life, some people they go for something a little bit more meaningful. They go for family, for example. They say, my purpose in life is a bit more meaningful. And that is my children, my spouse, my family, uh, to give, to leave a legacy behind, to give in charity and to help develop this world. I want to contribute. I want to leave something behind. You know, just enjoying life by giving and by seeing other people happy and creating a peaceful or working towards creating a good world for everyone before I die. Now, that's a really noble, meaningful thing to do, actually. And we Muslims, alhamdulillah, I'm going to talk about that. It is very heavy in our religion. It's probably the core of our religion of Islam are these things. However, we still have a problem. And then what? If you make only what is in this world, no matter how meaningful it is, your, your object and your success, and that's how you measure it, at the end of the day, what's still going to happen? What's the ultimate thing that we cannot escape? Death. In the end, you're still going to die. And if you think about it too much, your brain will start playing mind games on you. They'll say, well, what's the point of doing anything good anyway? since I'm going to die. It's like our children when, when they say to their parents, why should I vacuum the carpet, mum? Why should I help dad mow the lawn? It's going to grow anyway. Why should we clean up the house? It's going to get dirty anyway. Why should I do my bed? It's going, I'm going to sleep back in it anyway. What's the point of showering? I'm going to get dirty anyway. So this mindset is a terrible, terrible mindset. That's what the shaitan wants you to be. A Muslim should never, ever be like that. But in the reality, we're still going to die. You're still going to leave your family behind. You're still going to leave your contributions behind, your legacy, you won't get to live to enjoy it and to see it, you'll just turn into soil. No feelings, nothing. The same way before you came into this world, you become non-existent. So what is the purpose and what is the point? Well, brothers and sisters, there is also three other questions that will always stay there too. And that is, where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going from here? We do have a purpose here. And as a Muslim, we know that we came from Allah. Allah put us here. Okay, what does Allah want from us by putting us here? Why not putting us in the hereafter immediately? Why not just chuck, it over the, chuck us over there since He knows we're going to paradise and hellfire? Well, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored, honored the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to experience and to fulfill and to live through what connects us to Him. He's 99 names. For example, Allah is the most merciful. Allah wants us to experience mercy. Allah wants us to give mercy and to receive mercy. Allah is loving and caring and compassionate and forgiving. Allah wants to forgive us and we forgive others and receive forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to manifest this creation and the beauty on earth and through us the beauty comes out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to contribute and to provide and to leave legacies and to help others and to have a network of relationships and families so we can experience this amazing beauty which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us and to connect us to Him. But He didn't leave us like that. He gave us guidance. We have a huge purpose. The fact that you are breathing right now, brothers and sisters, the fact that you are breathing right now means that you are an ultimate purpose in this life. Each and every one of you, each, every individual, this child over here, you, 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 me, every one of us, if you are breathing, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still has a purpose for you. You have a purpose in this world that it would not happen without your existence. And the purpose, inshallah, you have choice to it as well. Your purpose, every one of us has a different purpose in life, but ultimately there is one ultimate goal. So I'm going to start like this by saying, brothers and sisters, success in a nutshell means this. It means to have goals and achieve those goals. That's the meaning of success in a nutshell. 
the closer you get to the goals, the greater success you have achieved. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right. But the problem now is what kind of goals? Not just any goals. People have all sorts of goals in life. Some of them are meaningless goals. Some of them are harmful, terrible, evil goals. If I have a goal to go and rob a particular store and I achieve that goal, that is success. But is it good success or bad success? Bad success. If I intend to go and bash that person and go and get my revenge and then I, 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 I get that person and, and leave a family who is saddened and grieved over them because of my, my anger and my revenge, I have succeeded in my goal. But is it a good goal? Is it a good success? No. Allah says in the Quran to be careful about people when you are doing your work and reaching your goal. Not everything is good success. Some things are just gone and will not benefit you whatsoever. Allah says, قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ أَعْمَالًا أَلَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shall I tell you about those who are the biggest losers in their efforts and work? They are the ones who have drawn a path in this life towards the wrong end. While they thought that the, what they were doing was actually good, but it was a destruction. So how do we know? Well, brothers and sisters, a Muslim has two goals. You must have two ultimate goals. The One of them, well, two goals. The first one is the ultimate permanent goal. The ultimate permanent goal. A goal that is permanent and everlasting. A goal that in mathematics, if you multiplied it by any number, that number turns into zero. Anyone know mathematics here? All right. If there is something, if there's something that's infinite, you know what infinite means? Never ending. There is no end to it. And you multiply it by any number you wish. Any number you wish. An infinite, infinity times any number. Do you know what it equals? Huh? It, equal, it, it equals zero. Infinity times any number equals zero. Now, Sorry, divided... It is divided by equals zero. Now it's multiplication. Just because you're a lawyer. Yeah? Is it divided or multiplied? Someone Google it. Come on, Google it. Is zero. Okay, all right. Okay, so any, we'll go by Brother Fatmir's words. I think I trust him. He's got a higher degree than me. So we'll go infinity divided by any number equals zero. Anyone Googled it? Anyway, you got the point. Let's move on. <laughs> In my last talk, I said, accept your mistakes. So if I'm mistaken, alhamdulillah, I'm very happy that my brother here corrected me. Brothers and sisters, let's move on. So the point is... The hereafter, which is paradise, is infinite, has never, has, is never ending. And this world is finite. Everything in this universe is finite. It comes to an end. This is an established fact. What is this world measured to the hereafter that is infinite? Absolutely nothing. So who of us will work for something and make it our ultimate goal when it will end and round it up to zero in the end? Nothing. So brothers and sisters, our ultimate goal is what? Our ultimate goal, as Allah says in the Qur'an, is to enter paradise and to be saved from hellfire. As simple as that. Allah says in the Qur'an, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازَ 
وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور. In Surah Al Imran 185, Allah says, Everyone shall taste death. And only on the day of resurrection shall you be paid your wages in full. And whoever is removed away from the fire and admitted to paradise, he indeed is successful. He indeed is successful. The life of this world is only the enjoyment of deception, a deceiving thing. That is the ultimate success. That is the ultimate and permanent goal. So now... We've set ourselves up to talk about the second type of goal, and that is the temporary, the temporary and minimal goals in life. You cannot reach the ultimate goal if you don't know how to set your goals here too. Yeah, this, this earth, according to Islam, according to the Quran, this world is like a farming land. It is where you plant your seeds. And whatever grows from what you plant, you will reap it and take it in the hereafter. Now, you plant. In the hereafter, you receive. Does that make sense? Let's move on. A lot of people say, well, what dua should I make? For Allah to make me enter paradise ultimately and to save me from the fire. Well, brothers and sisters, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to one man, What do you say in your prayers and supplications? And the man said, Ya Rasulullah, I say the shahada, at the shahad, which means I say tahiyat if it's in prayer, or I testify the shahada in my dua first. ثم أسأل الله الجنة. Then I ask Allah for paradise. وأعوذ به من النار. And I seek His refuge from the fire. أما والله ما أحسن دندنتك ولا دندنة معاذ. He said, O Messenger of Allah, forgive me. I swear by Allah, I cannot make it eloquent like your yodeling and Muadh's yodeling. So he says to hum, and your voice goes up and down as you hum your dua. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said. We both yodel around just that. So if you don't know any other dua, it's enough to say, Oh Allah, allow me to enter paradise, grant me paradise and save me from the fire. All the dua, everything that you do in your life, every dua that you've ever made, every intention, every goal for a Muslim is all about that end two goals. To be saved from the fire and to enter paradise. Whoever is safe from the fire into paradise has truly succeeded. All right, brothers and sisters, let us look at the life goals now. A Muslim must have life goals. Get rid of this mentality that I see a lot of our young brothers and sisters, well, even older ones, the Muslims, where we think we can just sit on the border just like that, pray five times a day, uh, fast our month of Ramadan, Pay our zakat, go to hajj, get married, and for some men, marry many women, up to four, and uh, have children, teach them the Quran, and that's it. Brothers and sisters, that is only a very small part. We're going to talk about well, how does a Muslim live their life and set their goals. And you're going to be amazed at how the Sunnah teaches us. The Prophet ﷺ also said, and the hadith is in Bukhari, he said, if the final hour comes, if the final hour comes, while you have a shoot of plant in your hands, and it is possible to plant it before the hour comes, then plant it. Allah. Do you guys know what this hadith means? Brothers and sisters, we can't just read hadiths and ayat of the Quran on surface level. We need to go deeper. We need to analyze. We need to think harder. Ask questions. What is the Prophet ﷺ saying? If the last hour, you heard the last hour is coming and you have a shoot of plant, what's the point of planting a plant when, the, when it's going to end? Rasulullah is telling us, your purpose in life is not the outcome. That's Allah's business. Allah SWT does that. You, Allah looks at your efforts and what? Two things. Efforts and intentions. 
All actions are by what? By intentions. Okay, let me, let me ask you a question. If I enter a room and I saw a cup that had some liquid in it and I wanted to drink wine and in that cup was what looked like wine. So I go to drink it with the intention that I want to drink wine. And then I find out it's apple juice. Am I sinned? Huh? I am sinned. I lost both worlds. <laughs> number one, I didn't get the wine. And number two, I got sinned. Walayyadu billah. Actions are by intentions. Type the other way around. I go in, I thought it was apple juice, ended up being wine. I drank and I got astaghfirullah. Do I get sinned? No. It's not the outcome, it's my effort and intention. I did my best to find out, but it didn't work. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. One of the first things that I see Muslims, it deters them away from success, are these little things. They stop themselves and start to get OCDs over things that Islam has made easy, an easy way out. They start not being able to forgive themselves for months and years. Why did I do that? How could I do that? Yeah, akhi, it's okay. Islam is, Allah did not bring the, the, the Quran and Islam to make life difficult on you. Allah says, Ya Taha, ma anzalna alayka al Quran li tashqa. Taha, we have not sent this Quran upon you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in order to make life miserable for you. Not so that you can reach misery. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Allah did not make in this religion hardship upon you. We make it hard. So brothers and sisters, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intentions. Now I'm going to talk about the first pathway to being successful and then a second pathway that complements this one. Two pathways I'm going to talk to you about. You can choose one or the other, or you can blend between the two. As I told you, these are studies by thousands of experts and scholars, both in the Islamic world and non-Muslim world. So the first pathway I want to talk about is called building your productivity. A Muslim has to be productive, my dear brothers and sisters. A Muslim has to be what? Productive. Remember the hadith we mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago. We said, Two believers. One is strong, one is weak. The strong believer is better than the weak believer. And we talked about strong iman, strong resilience, strong willpower. We talked about what makes you a strong character. We talked about resources. We talked about finances. We talked about strength and health and so on. And we also said a mu'min, as Rasul also said, Inna Allah yuhibbu al-abda idha amila amalan yutqinhu. Allah loves a servant that when he or she decides to do something, a good project, masters it. You don't stop halfway. Continue to the end even if you fail along the way. Continue. Remember when we mentioned in the hadith, in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu when they were going to Uhud. Do you remember that battle of Uhud? And, and this is something Muslims do when they study the seerah. Don't focus on the battles, but rather focus on what, how the Prophet Sallallahu was teaching his companions during all these events. The human side, the wisdom side, the leadership side, the development side. What is he teaching them? It's not about the sword. It's not about the battle. It's about everything in between. Would you imagine sometimes battles would be happening and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi is discussing and teaching his companions how to make tayammum, how to make wudu, what breaks the wudu, all these things. It's constant learning. So he wore the armor, he wore the armor, and the companions had uh, exerted energy and sort of put pressure on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in an innocent way that, Ya Rasulullah, let's go out. We think we should go out and face them. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said we should stay in Medina. And then when he saw the majority ruled, he went inside and wore his armor. When he came out, the companions felt regret and they felt sorry. 
they felt that they may have put pressure on the Prophet وسلم, and they, they regret and they said, Ya Rasulullah, forgive us. We may have compromised and made you feel a little bit uncomfortable. So we'll go with what you said. And he said, a prophet when he, or she, when he wears the armor does not take it off. Meaning, as Allah says, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Once you make a decision and you're determined, then keep going. Don't stop. And now, the building and being productive is four parts. I'm going to talk about four parts. The first part is to be successful in building yourself. To be successful in building yourself. To develop yourself. To develop yourself, there are four things. Number one. Number one. I want the young people to listen to this first one. How do you make yourself developed? Stronger, better, more productive for yourself and for others. Number one, take responsibility, man. Take responsibility. Meaning you are able to respond to your actions. You take them. Admit when you make a mistake. If you did, if you did it right, alhamdulillah. If you did it wrong, take responsibility. There are no excuses, brothers and sisters. Avoid excuses. No blame. Don't put the blame on anything or anyone or any event. Or on any flimsy excuse. Or, are you ready to hear this one? Don't put the blame on supernatural occurrences. You know what supernatural occurrences are? Making up a belief or a myth of some supernatural nature and saying it's because of that. There is a book, comedic book, it's called The 365 Excuses for Being Late to Work. You can put it for anything else. 365 excuses for being late to school, 356 excuses to being late to home, anything else. It's all comedy, it's all jokes. And it makes fun of people who make excuses. And it gives you 365 different excuses to say to your boss and to other people why you were late. Um, things like you were trying a new juice blender and it wasn't charged very well and you were trying to work out the instructions and it made you late to work. Uh, you blame it on you were having a nice dream and you just thought, I'll sleep another five minutes. Five minutes became ten minutes, sorry. Or blame it on the wife or the kids or on something like that. Take responsibility. All it requires is you to better manage yourself. That's all it is. I remember once I used to be late to work for a little while, and uh, my, uh, my, um, my colleague said to me something very simple, and it worked. He said, I'm sorry I'm 10 minutes late. And he said to me, just wake up 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> Scratch my head and I go, yeah, he's right. Wake up 10 minutes earlier. Is that 10 minutes that precious to get that much sleep in? Some of us, if we don't get that 10 minutes, we've got to work it out somehow in the day. I've got to make up that 10 minutes. I've got to sleep somewhere. No, no, no. No, you make the decision if you want to be energetic and energized or not. And laziness is a decision too. Energy is a decision. Laziness is a decision. Okay, I know that sometimes if you're very tired and you're sick, that's a different story. Anyway, brothers and sisters... No excuses for a believer. Take responsibility. Sometimes a student comes up or the parent, you have an interview with them. I'm a teacher, as you know. And sometimes a student says, why did you fail me, sir? I didn't fail you. The parent says, why did the school fail my son, my daughter? This is the school's fault. It's the teacher's fault. We don't fail anybody. Your child failed. They didn't put in what is needed. Don't put blame on others. And don't think when no one's attacking you. Just take responsibility and see what you can do better. Don't take, because that's going to drag on in the rest of your life. A Muslim should not be like that. Another thing a Muslim does is uh, they start to blame family. They start blaming the world for their problems. I'm oppressed, I'm vulnerable, it's my parents, my family's toxic, uh, my teacher's fault, etc. 
Brothers and sisters, there's no need to say that. Trust me, turn it around and look at yourself and say, what can I do? And do it. Do something better. Don't run away from it. Sometimes we get upset with someone and say, I cut them off. Block them, block them because they're toxic. But everybody says that. You can solve a problem. If you can't solve it, you can minimize a problem. Don't just cut it all off. We have a famous statement among the scholars, If you can't take it all, don't leave it all. Keep some string. I'll give you an example. Uh, someone asked me, if my child decides to leave Islam, I've asked this question a lot of, from many different people, should we cut them off and just block them off and never see them ever again? I said, at least one of you, if all of you block them off, one of you keep a little hair between you and him. Just keep some communication. You might think, what? Kafir, apostate. I said, no. no. Some people are really misguided. They just don't know. They're confused. And I've had many people who left Islam and came back, alhamdulillah. Just about three weeks ago, up in the uh, other side of the town here, we had a 17, 18-year-old who came and says, I want to renew my shahada. Left Islam for two years, decided I made a mistake. Don't ever judge people and say, Khalas, they're out of the picture. Nuh salam did not leave his son to the last breath until the wave came and took him while his father is still trying. So there's a difference. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this, that don't just cut off everything because you're going to fall into bigger problems. Now, one important thing I want to say. Remember how I said some people, they blame on supernatural events. Their life decisions are connected so heavily on their dreams they make their dreams like it's Qur'an sent down from heaven. Like it's a rule or a command. Or they connect it to, let's say, jinns. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm possessed. If that doesn't work, maybe someone's done magic on me. If that doesn't work, everyone resorts to the classical one. Someone's given me the eye. Why doesn't my car work? Well, my car hasn't been working for a while. I've been going to the mechanic several times. It's never happened before. Maybe there's an eye. Sheikh, can you please come and read on my car? Just get some water and splash it all over the car. And, okay. Some people, they say, well, in my house, I don't know. I've been uh, feeling a bit down lately and things are going wrong. My light bulb doesn't work. And the other day it flooded. It, um, um, it, um, what's the word for it? flickered, and all that stuff. Please read on my house. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. The eye on a person does not show that way. To have magic done on you, to have a jinn, or to have sorcery, is a very, very, very small chance. I'm talking about 0.01% chance. I, I used to read on people, you know, this ruqya thing that you call Ruqya in Islam is, is true, it's in the Sharia. Rasul said, La lam takun shirka. There's no, nothing wrong with spiritual healing so long as it's not filled with shirk. But I'll tell you what I left it a long time ago. Because forgive me, brothers and sisters, I found that 90% of them are just liars. They're just making it up. Or they think they're possessed or something's wrong with them in that way. But it's either some kind of anxiety or depression. Did you know that you can hyperventilate? and your eyes will flutter. You can hyperventilate, and you will lose consciousness. You can hyperventilate, and you can start, uh, your speech becomes uh, different, as if a person is possessed, or something like that. So, the likelihood of it is very, 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 very small, and I don't even say the word possession. There's no such thing as called possession. There's in the Quran, it says mas, like a connection, but there is no definition for it among the scholars. There's different opinions. The point that I want to make out of this, brothers and sisters, whether it's, you know, there or not, the majority of us are not possessed. There's no magic done on us. There's no eye on you. Because why do I only hear it from the Muslims all the time? It's like nobody else gets possessed against Muslims. No eye as it happens except to Muslims. Dreams. I know I gave one talk about dreams the other day, and people took it like it was Quranic ayah. I had thousands of people holding on to everything they saw in their dream as if it was Quran. Ya akhi, we have the Quran with us. 
Why did Allah bring us the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu if it's all based on dreams and that's it? Dreams are just a little tiny feeling of something, but we don't have a measure to interpret it for you, brothers and sisters. Nobody, only the Prophets can really interpret it. Instead, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, talk to someone who you trust and love and, and loves you and full of wisdom. And if it's a dream that makes you feel good, because usually the way you interpret the dream is the way you're going to live it out. It's a psychological thing, really. There's a lot of psychology in it, brothers and sisters. And sometimes there are good dreams from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you know, some people they say, oh, I saw Allah in my dream. I've had this said to me se several times. A guy who's wearing a turban and uh, a beard, and I don't know, when we said, subhanAllah, this is the shaitan coming to you and making you to uh, appear that way to teach you the wrong way. Some people manipulate others and they say, I, just, I saw Allah a thousand times and I saw the prophet this many times. Everybody goes, Allah is a saint. And then he makes himself a prophet himself. Everybody, and then takes the money from them and starts manipulating people. Brothers and sisters, be careful. This is not how the scholars and the prophets taught us. So number one, brothers and sisters, don't let these things deter you from your success. Stop holding on to supernatural things. Sometimes it's out of our mind. Sometimes people want to get married. And let's say the parent doesn't want that spouse for them, doesn't want that person, doesn't like that guy, doesn't like that girl. So they come and use religion. They go and make a stikhara, the mother and father, and they come and they say, daughter, son, wallah, we saw in our dreams, this person is killing people in the neighborhood. Wallah, we saw in our dreams, this person has got a farm of, of marijuana, is selling it to people and drugs. Stay away from him. It's because you don't want him. Some people, they use this as, as a, this is wallah, haram. Haram. So brothers and sisters, this deters us. Stop thinking about this stuff. Keep going forward, inshallah. Yani the, the eye, for example, al ainu haqq, Rasul said, eye is true, the evil eye. But in all of the... 23 years of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, and about 30 years of the lives of the Khulafa, 53 years, the historian, the, 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 uh, the scholars of seerah and history, the Muslim scholars of seerah have only mentioned two or three incidents of the evil eye. With us, it's happening a hundred times a day. <laughs> anyway, brothers and sisters, don't hold on to this. Keep going, brothers and sisters, and move forward. A Muslim doesn't let these things hold them back. If you fail, try again. But when you try again, try a different way. Einstein used to say, if you try something the same way, do not expect a different result. You're always going to get the same result, so try things a different way. I think it was Edison who uh, invented the light bulb. Am, am I right? Take away the controversies, but I think the one who invented the light bulb, Edison, he said, I learnt... 260 ways of how a light bulb will not work. Do you know what that means? It means before he succeeded, he had 260 mistakes. So he said, I can teach you 260 ways the light bulb will not work. Until he found the way. So a Muslim will fail and try again and try again. The believers failed in the battle of Uhud. And Allah says, La tahsabuhu sharran lakum bal huwa khayrun lakum. Don't assume of it as bad for you, it is good for you. So goodness does come out of it. Okay, we'll move on to the second one now, I'll go a bit faster. The second thing of developing yourself is, brothers and sisters, be authentic to yourself. Be honest with yourself. Be authentic to yourself. Be honest with yourself. Don't make flimsy excuses. Don't go around and say, oh, because of this. Be honest. And, and what do you do with that? I mentioned it last time. Sit down. Get a piece of paper or a book. Some people need a book. And write down all the faults and shortcomings that you can identify in yourself. Now these speakers, they talked about the same thing. And I went and tried it the other day. And I counted 53. 53 problems in me. <laughs> Do you think I looked at it as low self-esteem or that I'm a failure or a loser? No. I looked at it to see, okay, good. These are the areas I can improve on. Is there anyone who is perfect? No. The moment I accepted my imperfection, Allah, my self-esteem shot through the roof. I don't care if you find a fault in me. I already found it before you and I own it. One kid, you know, sometimes students they say, you're like this or you're like that. I say, yeah, I am. <laughs> what, my bald head? Yeah, yeah, my, I've got a bald head. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Someone says to you, I'll look at you, you look like this. Say, yeah, alhamdulillah, I do look like that. Allah made me like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what, do you, what do you know? So what? The point is, brothers and sisters, if you have failures, 
remember one time playing soccer with my friends when I was back in, in primary school and secondary school, and I was really bad at soccer. Uh, they made me the goalkeeper. <laughs> you guys know why. If you're supposed to the goalkeeper in goalkeepers, you're, not, you're going to stuff up the game, so they put you as goalkeeper. Then they try to keep the ball away from you. I still failed, even with great players, and we still lost the game. They made fun of me, of everything I did. I was a little kid, but I learned from that, that, subhanAllah, I'm not really good at soccer. I'm going to go and get someone to teach me a little bit more. And I did. I wasn't good at basketball. And then I go, man, I've got to, I got to share basketball games with, with some students and people and I went and got my nephew to teach me. Who cares? Brothers and sisters, the thing is, you know your failures, doesn't matter, they're not failures, they're areas for you to grow on. Number three, be a person of willpower. I find this in young people a lot. Will. Nobody can decide for you to study. Nobody can decide for you to read. Nobody can decide for you to do a course. Nobody can decide for you to do your bed. Nobody can decide for you to look after yourself and to um, make something of yourself. You have to decide. Your mother and father can put you in a room, lock you up, and put you in there for four hours with all the books and the textbooks and everything you need until you study. You're not getting out of there until blah, 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 until you do your studies. You might go ahead and, and sit there for four hours and say, well, I studied. Sir, I studied. Parents, I studied. Well, four hours every day. I remember one student, I came up to him and said, did you study? Did you, did you really study? And he goes, honestly, I was just, I was just reading that like that. I didn't even read. That's not studying. The only person who can make you study is you. The only person who can make the money is, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and strive towards it is you. The only person who can learn about management is you. The only person who can get up and get dressed is you. If you don't make that decision, you will not do it. It's called wishful thinking. So you've got to be convinced of your goal and connect yourself to some people who are distinguished. Don't just keep having the same surroundings and people that you always talk to day in, day out. What are you going to learn from them? Change your connections. Find out who is distinguished. Who, who at the school? Who in my work? Who in the environment? Who at the masjid? Who anywhere? Who, it seems like this person has got something that normal people don't have or the ordinary people don't have. Why don't I go and have a connection with that person? Maybe I can learn something. Now on social media, you have a lot of these people we call gurus, gurus in different areas. Follow them. Follow them and learn from them. Number four, take control of your behavior. If you want to develop yourself, take control of your what? Behavior. Don't be, don't live your life as a reactionary. You just react. Someone gets you upset, you react. Somebody provoked you, you react. Some people, they say to me, I'm not motivated. I don't feel like doing it. Get out of here. Stop this. Stop this, princess. If you're going to go by motivations and feelings, you're not going to achieve anything. Can you imagine that? Every morning you wake up, I don't feel like waking up. Allahu Akbar, imagine everybody thought that way. I don't feel like drinking water. You still go and drink water because your body needs it. Be disciplined. Say, I, I'm going to do it. And tell yourself to be quiet. Shut yourself up and say, stop. Get up and do it. And you'll feel proud about yourself, inshallah. Otherwise, you won't achieve it. So don't be a reactionary person. Uh, a student said to me, came with a broken hand one day and I said, what happened? He said, fire out, man, it's my brother's fault. I go, what happened? He got me angry and I punched the wall. When you, it's not your brother, it's you. He made me swear. She made me like this. It's my mum. She's like, she just gets on my nerves. That's why I, I became like this. No, no, you don't inherit anger. You don't inherit bad behavior. Bad behavior is learned. You can make a decision. You can make a Decision. I'll give you something called the 90 second rule. It's established science that once you get angry, once your emotions play up, your whole body goes through a process, a hormonal process. That hormonal process that goes everywhere, haywire, like a, a storm inside of you, lasts for 90 seconds. If you can wait until it all, your body gets back to normal, then you're able to think. After that, if you continue to be angry and emotional, it means you want to be. You can say to yourself, I don't want to be. Hands up. If you can promise yourself right now 
that for the next seven days, you're not going to get angry. Who would like to? Okay, I'm going, I'm going to do it with you. I promise. I promise. In the next seven days, that I will not get angry. I hear someone maybe thinking, I can hear your thinking say, Brother, how can you say that? Only Allah knows the future. How can you say that? <laughs> of course Allah knows the future. But you have a willpower. You can make a promise, see what happens. You wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to be energetic. Wallahi, try it. Say to yourself, I'm going to be energetic, even if you slept for four hours. Watch what happens in the day. Wallahi, I've tried it. I try all these. They say to me, how come you smile? I say, because I've made a decision this morning, I'm going to smile. And the more you smile, you smile better. And other people around you smile too. Then you see them smile and go, oh my God, everybody's cheerful. It's because you started it. You started it. Start something good. Rasulullah said, start a good sunnah. Now we move to the second success. It's called this, and I'll move quicker now, the success of relationships. Brothers and sisters, you cannot reach paradise and be safe from the fire until your relationships are right. And your relationships have to be based on halal and haram. They have to be based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you as a duty. So here's the first thing. Identify your roles. Who are you? Are you a father? Are you a mother? Are you a brother? Are you a sister? Are you a child, a son, a daughter? Are you a boss? Are you an employee? Are you a business person? Are you a leader? Are you a worker? Who are you? Are you a teacher? Are you an imam? Who are you? Every single one of you has a role in life, brothers and sisters. Every one of you is a shepherd and everyone is responsible for their flock. Are you a neighbor? Are you a member of the community? Every one of you has a place. Identify who you are. Where is your role? Once you identify your role, brothers and sisters, then number one, write it down. Write down, my role is one, two, three, four, five. These are the places that Allah has blessed me with, and I am there. So I am a son. I am also a brother. I am also a teacher. I am also a neighbor. I am also a pet owner. I am also, I'm also identify the roles that you have. Once you do that, the second thing you've got to do is fulfill your obligation towards each role. What is your obligation towards your father, your mother, your neighbor, yourself, your friend, your spouse, your pet, your children, all of that, your siblings? What does Allah say to you? And you do it in this order, priority. You ready for the priority in relationships? Some of you might not like it in this day and age, but I'm going to tell you straight out according to Islam. The priorities in the relationships are, number one, your parents, number one. Number two, your immediate family, so your wife or your husband, your children. Number three, your relatives. Number four, your friends. In that order. What? My parents come before my wife, before my husband, for my children? Yeah. Yeah. But not the way you're thinking. Each one has a right. The rights of your parents are not like the rights of your children. But why did I put the parents first? Because number one, Islam put them first. And number two, the reason it put them first is because as they get older, they get weaker. And you can manage it. If you're many siblings, share the role. That's another topic. But remember, your parents are easy to let go of. People cut off their parents all the time. They're toxic. They're not good. Remember what I told you? If you can't solve it, minimize it. One girl said to me, my father, he's like this and like that. I said, can you solve it? No, I can't. So minimize it. She says, I can't. I said, all right. Are you safe? No, I'm not safe. I go, all right then. Do you have any relatives? Anyone else you can be safe with? Yes, so and so. So alhamdulillah, we organized the place for her. But she continued to talk to her father. Didn't cut him off completely. Reestablish the relationship. Get a mediator. Get a help. The thing is, brothers and sisters, we never just give up and stop. Anyway, that's a long story. So parents in general followed by immediate family, followed by relatives, then friends, and so on. Number three, take control of your actions. You take control of your actions. You take control of how you want to act. All right? You understand what that means? And number four, good manners and pure intentions. 
So if you want to succeed in your relationships, have good manners and pure intentions. Another word for it is emotional intelligence. Have you ever heard of emotional intelligence? I'm going to tell you about emotional intelligence with relationships. The great, great experts talked about this. They said, imagine emotions with rela in relationships like an emotional bank. What do you do in a bank? What do you do at a bank? What do you do at a bank? You deposit and, and withdraw. These are two things we do in a bank. We deposit and withdraw. Think of relationships and emotion, emotional connection with other people like a bank where you deposit and withdraw. For example, in the beginning of your marriage, when you're engaged, getting to know each other in a halal way, you're both really lying to each other. It's all acting. <laughs> because the emotions are up there, you're on your best behavior. So forget about the emotions and all that stuff. Focus on what really matters. After all the honeymoon and everything goes away, the hardest part is the first year. It's when you're learning about each other. That's when the conflicts start to come. Oh, you're like this. Oh, I didn't know like that. Don't worry. That's okay. You're learning about each other. Here's a trick. The more you deposit of your goodness towards someone, the more your investment is and the stronger the relationship becomes. A nice word is an investment, a compliment, time, physical support, money, defending someone, being there for them, spending time with them, appreciating them, helping them. The more you do that, the more you are depositing into the emotional bank the more it will be remembered. In the beginning, the first year, because of your honeymoon, you haven't really deposited much. That's why they say in the first year, about 36% of marriages fail in the first year because they're not patient with each other. And number two, they haven't deposited enough. They haven't invested enough. Invest them in the halal way, of course. What you need to avoid is withdrawing too much. Deposit more, withdraw less. Stop sucking the person dry. That's where toxicity comes in. And it has to be mutual between you and the other person. Otherwise, you distance. The more you deposit, the less you withdraw, the greater the memories. Good memories. What is relationships? It's memories. What is relationships? Memories. Whether it's husband and wife, parents and children, cousins, friends, at the workplace, anything, anyone, even animals. Your cat will love you more when it feels you're depositing more. They just show their affection in different ways. Anything. So it's called the emotional bank. Take this as a rule, inshallah. So, my brothers and sisters, I move to the third one, and that is... You must be successful in giving and contributing. Giving, contributing, and wealth. You can't contribute and give without wealth. So I'm going to talk about both of them. What have you contributed, brother and sister? What have you contributed to your community, to your family, to your school, to your friends, to yourself, to your brothers and sisters, to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to your relatives? What have you contributed to this world, to your job, to your projects? What have, what have you contributed? Identify your skills and your resources. Have you done anything distinguished? One person said to me, I've got a nine to five job. I've got a job at Macca's. I'm working at KFC. That's good. But that's not distinguished. Find a contribution that is distinguished. Something that not the ordinary person is doing. You can find it. That will make a huge difference. And there are four things to talk about when it comes to contributing. Number one, brothers and sisters, a Muslim identifies one thing and chooses it to master it. You all know the saying, right? What's the saying? 
Don't be a jack of all trades, master of none. Don't be a jack of all trades, you'll become a master of none. Be a master of one, everything else are called hobbies, extras. They're supplementary. Once you identify one thing, one area that you want to master, keep going. Keep going in thick and thin. I don't care if it's sunny, rainy, shiny, painful, hurt. You've got to get through it. You're going to master it, inshallah. You've got to make that decision. You want to finish year 12? Master it. You want to get into uni? Master it. You want to do that course? Do everything that it takes and master it. You want to go and do something else? Master it. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. The person that we disrespect is the person who has no goal, no ambition, no project, nothing. Just sitting there saying, who are you? What are you doing? Where do you belong? You're a burden on everybody and on yourself. Allah gave you the ability. Find one thing, master it, brothers and sisters, and make it your thing. Whether it's a trade or whether it's academic, whether it's a book, whether anything, whatever in your life, master it. After you've mastered it, brothers and sisters, to master it, do this. First, you need an interest, ability, and an opportunity. Use 50% of your time to master that thing. And 10% of your time for everything else. So 60%. The rest of it, do your other duties that Allah created you for. Identify your goals. Brothers and sisters, very quickly, you need to make three types of goals in life. One year goal, five year goal, and a ten year goal. These, I'm not just throwing these numbers around. These have been studied by tens of thousands of experts over time. One year goal, what do you want to, what do you want to, where do you want to be in one year's time? Where do you want to be in five years' time? Where do you want to be in ten years' time? Ten years' time, big project. Number three, draft a plan. Be realistic. Number four, be consistent in trying, even if you fail. Coming to money, you need money. You need finances. And I'll tell you something about money. Make a financial goal. For one year, five years, ten years, and twenty years. And the golden rule of management is this. If you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. So you can't say, I want to be rich. I want to be a millionaire. No, you can't do that. You have to work towards it. You have to have a plan. Here is something that I learned from this great Muslim businessman. He said, You need to double your monthly income every three years. You have a monthly income, let's say, of $5,000 a month. Within three years, you must have $10,000. Within the next three years, $20,000, and so on. If you work a nine-to-five job, you're not going to be able to do it. So learn how to invest. What? We're talking? We're in the masjid, we're talking about money. Yeah. You know the ten who were promised paradise? The companions, Ashram Basharun, seven of them were extremely wealthy in money. And that is why they helped support Islam and Muslims. And that is why they're still in our minds till today. Even Uthman was one of them. And his well, which he bought, is still going till today, benefiting in Saudi Arabia, in, in Medina. Wealth and good intentions, proper intentions, brings goodness. And give charity. Every week, or every month. I don't care how much it is, give a regular charity. Charity has a secret to it. said, No wealth ever diminishes because of charity, meaning your money becomes blessed. You find that it lasts longer, insha'Allah. Brothers and sisters, very quickly again, you need to be successful for your hereafter. What's the point? To be successful in life when you throw away your hereafter and end up in hellfire. And there are four rules to it. Purify your intention. Be sincere. And don't show off your good deeds. Don't come to the mosque because people are watching you. Don't wear you know, your hijab solely because of showing it off. And at the same time, the opposite. Don't not pray. Don't not wear the hijab. Don't not stop haram because you don't want people to say things to you. 
Do it for the sake of Allah. Sincerity. And don't do it to show off. Some people say, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. You are ready. You're telling yourself you're not ready. Wallahi, you're ready. One Indian uh, actress, Muslim, she said, I watched it the other day, I forgot her name, subhanAllah, very famous. She said, I attended a funeral and there was a woman who had passed away and they shrouded her with the white shroud and then they covered her hair. And I asked, why do you need to cover her hair? And they said, Islamically, we mean to return them back to Allah in the way that He loves them to be covered. He ordered this for women and that's the way He would like to receive His property. And this lady, this actress, famous actress, she said, it hit me. I don't want the first day I wear my hijab, my last day on this earth, when I'm being washed. When are we going to be ready for salah? When are we going to be ready to change our lives? And I'm not talking just about hijab, I'm talking about brothers as well. When are we going to be ready to be fair to our family? When are we going to be ready to stop earning our wealth in haram and spending it in haram? When are we going to be ready? When? 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 60 years old. 60 years old, he decides to go and grow a tobacco farm business. Habibi, you're nearing you're, you're, you're near your grave. <laughs> Why end your life with something haram? Another person, I'm going to go and rot the system. I'm going to go and do this and, and I'm going to justify it religiously somehow. One person said to me, hey, akhi, so what if we do all this haram? We're living in a kafir country anyway. It's all haram. So, so, what? What? What did you just say? If you're saying you're living in a kafir country, so why not do haram? It's like you've accepted. So you're, you, you think this is hellfire, so might as well do it. Might as well enjoy hellfire. Not get out of it. But then who told you just because you're living in a kafir country, who told you just, this is haram to live here? So long as you're able to practice your deen, nobody's standing in your way. It's your decision. Don't try and make up excuses now. <laughs> just because you want to earn a little bit more wealth and money hungry with haram. Number two, get to know Allah better. We know His 99 names. Go and study them, brother and sister. Go on YouTube. Go to the great scholars. Type 99 names. Read about them. Get a book and read about it. Know Allah better. Not just by names. Know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. Number three, get to know your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best leader. The best, most merciful, most compassionate in the universe. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a book called The Leadership Challenge by James Kozis and Barry uh, Ponsa. And they talk about the five C's called credibility, communication, commitment, confidence, and creativity. If you want to be a leader, do those five. Credibility, they said, how are you a credible person? How, what do people like in a leader? And they said two things. We want him to be a truth teller. And we want him or her to be trustworthy. Honest and trustworthy. What was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? As-sadiq al-ameen. The honest and trustworthy. That's a leader. In your home, in your work, everywhere. Brothers and sisters, lastly, perform your worship with your heart more than you do it with your body. Majority of us, which is good, we focus on the body. Did I do my hand right? Did I move my finger right? Did I bow exactly as it should be and in our entire mind 90% of us is about movements rather than the spirit inside our hearts it should be the other way around 90% or so is on the heart 10% is on the salat do you know why you pray tahit al-masjid when you come to the masjid why do we pray tahit al-masjid when we come in here why do we pray these two rak'ahs when we come in why do you think we do that yeah why huh to what to greet to the masjid not really. The masjid doesn't need greeting. I can say, hi, masjid. Assalamu alaikum. Why do I pray? But? Yeah. Number one, it's a warm-up. Number two, it puts you in the mindset of why you have come here. Why did you come here? So when you pray those two little rakas and you focus on them, it sets you up. The problem, however, is when people pray the two rakas and then after that, oh, no, 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 what's happening? Oh, no. <laughs> They're laughing their heads off and whatever. <laughs> stop it, stop it, man. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Oh, I better start it again. Alhamdulillah. Where's the khushu? There's nothing there, man. What is that? 
The whole idea is to set yourself. Listen, before you start your salat, count up to 20 and just stand there and wait. Brothers and sisters, the salat is about the heart more than the body. Those are the, the points that I wanted to mention. Of course, there's another pathway, but we don't have time. I don't want to uh, stress you out too much. But I'll mention very quickly just uh, four of them really, really, really quickly, the ones I haven't mentioned. Brothers and sisters, you need to uh, develop your mind, your brain. And I want to give you some advice, four advices. Number one, a Muslim must read. 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 Iqra. بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Oh my God, this is all about your brain. All about development and the mind. Read. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not read at that time. So read means learn. In the name of your Lord, learn. Seek Allah's help and read to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to live a life that is right. Read and your Lord is the helper and the support and the generous and the honorable. Read again. Iqra. The one who taught with the pen, he taught man that which he did not know. All about knowledge. Experts' opinion is that for adults at university and beyond should read two books per month. One book is equal to 200 pages. So if you read a book that's 400 pages, that's two books. Other than the textbooks and stuff. 50% of these books that you read should be in your specialty. Remember I said you've got to master one area? Read it about your mastery area. Always. And the miscellaneous ones, you read several other books. Grab a book about business, about politics, about history, about finances, about relationships, about psychology, about fiqh, about tafsir, anything, brothers and sisters, but make it meaningful. Read from it, as long as it benefits you. Number two, attend PD courses, personal development courses. There are many of them online. The general rule is 45 hours per year. 45 hours per year of workshops. Go and learn workshops that benefit you. Muslim, non-Muslim, doesn't matter. The internet is full of it. Number three, make a list of subject areas you want to read or further your learning about per year and ask the people for advice who know and start with the beginner's guide. Don't jump in there deep in. Number four, follow the gurus. I said it before. Look for gurus in each area. Follow them on social media. But make sure you follow the halal ones, not the ones who are teaching you bad things. Keep learning no matter what age you are, even if you are 100 years old. Because scientific studies have shown a fact that once a person stops learning, no matter how old you are, your brain cells start to degenerate and your age degenerates. You might say, oh, uh, life is the hands, in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also writes your age based on what He knows you're going to do. And right now you don't know what you're going to do, so do it. Don't sit there thinking qadr as if you know what qadr is. We don't know what Qadr is. We know in the past. We don't know the future. So why are you stopping yourself? You're creating a problem here. So keep going. Keep learning even to the last minute of your life. Insha'Allah ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, I was going to talk about the body, but I'll leave that insha'Allah. You want to know? Oh, come on, really? You don't want to know this. You don't want to know this. Okay, here we go. Develop your body. All right, here's the easy part. Monitor your weight. I told you guys, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt some people. You've got to monitor your weight. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, seriously, seriously. I'm not just talking about what people tell us. This is from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions used to say, a scholar does not have a bulging stomach. <laughs> he has to have a flat stomach. <laughs> now I know why some of you can't get up after this class. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> don't come and attack me. Don't come and attack me, brother. You know martial arts. I can't talk to you. <laughs> well, obviously, look, let me tell you something. 
monitor your weight for your own health if you can, as much as you can. Some people, they have conditions. Some people, they can't. Some people inherit it, and that is true. But the majority of us, we monitor our weight, and we try our best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at the intention and the effort rather than the outcome. But seriously, if you can monitor your weight, it is a healthy thing, and it is a sunnah from the Prophet sallallahu The rule of thumb is this. I'll tell you for men what weight you should be, and for women what weight you should be as well. Now, I've studied diet and nutrition for one year. Okay, so I've done a little bit of that and tested my BRI and everything. Here's the thing. For men, a very simple formula to remember. Measure your height in centimeters and take away 100. That's the ideal weight you should be. For example, if you are 180 centimeters tall, men, I'm talking to men, not the women yet. If a man is 180 centimeters, take away 100, it's 80 kilos. That's your ideal healthy weight. More than that, 82, 83, 84, it'll be slightly overweight. Even more than that, 90, 100, then you're getting to obesity. So it's important to monitor your weight. Now for women. For women, it's a little bit different. <laughs> it's a bit more complicated. <laughs> oh, subhanAllah. Actually, not too complicated. For women... Measure your height in centimeters and just take away 110. And that is your ideal weight, inshallah. <laughs> Brothers, clap, clap. <laughs> no, no, don't clap in the masjid. I made a mistake. All right. So, obviously, you try your best, inshallah. This is not a rule of Islam that you're going to go to hellfire if you don't do it. A'udhu billah. No, no, no. But for your own health and for your own sake, your body and your health is important. Number two, let's move to number two. This is a little bit uh, um, sensitive. Number two, your nutrition, your food and your drink. As a rule of thumb, I'll tell you these following things. Now, we have a lot of sisters here, and they mashallah, a lot about nutrition. Some of them probably got blogs. I don't know. I hope I get it right. But from what I know and from what I've read and, and attended workshops and from uni, in general, in your diet, have less fried food. An easy way of remembering it is fast food. So everything that's fried, have less of that. I'm not saying don't have it at all. I'm guilty of it. You've probably see me going to Halal Macca's drive through <laughs> Don't hold it against me. I'm trying, man. Number two, more grilled food rather than fried. Less red meat. It should be no... <laughs> Your brothers are going to hate this. You should not have red meat more than twice a week. Bah, that's so hard, isn't it? Twice a week? Well, you can have the white meat if you want, or fish. Be careful of the processed chicken, though. Too much of that can grow, especially for girls. Too much of the, of the KFC and all that stuff starts growing hair on your, on your face. Anyway, um, so that's another story. Uh, have less egg yolk. So have four yolks per week, four of the yellow one. Yeah, that's, that's, wallahi, these are, I'm not talking, um, these, these are studies by diet, dietitians and nutritionists. The white, the white part, not the yellow part. Come on, bro, make it easy on me. Avoid mayonnaise and the likes. The substitute for mayonnaise and the likes and sauces and all that, substitute it with green yogurt. Green yogurt? Greek yogurt. <laughs> green yogurt's not good. Greek yogurt, butter, almond sauce, hollandaise, or hollandaise, pesto, tahini. Those, those, I think, are good alternatives. And have less sweet and sugar. I'm not saying don't have sugar at all. You still need sugar in your body and sweets, but less. You know that white sugar? Cut it out of your life, guys. And very importantly, the soda, that Pepsi can, that Coca-Cola, especially that V-bottle. Wallah, brothers and sisters, I see the young people that come in and out of school. V-bottle, V-bottle. Ya Allah. Brothers and sisters, V-bottles are very bad for you. In fact, they're dangerous. If I was a mufti, I'd say they're haram. They are dangerous, guys. Wallah, I know a few friends. At the age of 19, they were in the hospital because of heart problems. They used to drink V-bottles before breakfast every single morning. Two, three V-bottles. And they're very addictive. They're not energy drinks. They're energy drinks that release the dopamine a blast of about 15 minutes and then you feel tired and drained. You can't study by period four and five or school. You can't do anything. 
Why? Because you've used up your dopamine. Instead, have things that release the energy little bit by little bit. Um, so, soda drinks. What makes me laugh are people who go down to Macca's and they come out because they feel guilty, right? They go down to Macca's, they buy a Big Mac, a double cheeseburger, and a Diet Coke. I'm looking after my weight. <laughs> oh, man. All right. <clears throat> Number three is exercise. Experts say and, and, um, uh, that minimum, 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 an average person should do about 20 to 30 minutes of exercise per day. And this ex or one hour, three times a week. That's minimum. I'm talking about the average normal person. I'm not talking about the gym person and all that stuff. And uh, depending on your age, you can increase. And the best exercises, they said, are in this order. Swimming is the best. Swimming is literally the best. Although even for very old people, even with people who've got osteoporosis or osteoarthritis or back problems, subhanAllah, anything got to do with bones and cartilage and muscle, subhanAllah, swimming is good. You don't have to go for the whole freestyle and breaststroke, but just walking in the water will help. Um, so if you can find a halal place, go for it. Uh, swimming. Uh, another one is skipping. That's the best for losing weight. Skipping. Grab a trampoline. Go on your children's trampoline if you like. Skipping really, mashallah. Uh, and obviously, walking, walking daily is excellent for you. Keep walking. Uh, fast walking, speed walking is not that good for you. It doesn't give you much of, a, of, of an effect. So walking, running is okay. Um, so here's the rule. If you exercise and have less fat, you'll lose weight and muscle. If you exercise and eat protein, you'll lose weight and gain muscle. And you'll have less fat. If you have less fat and less exercise, you will lose weight and muscle. So brothers and sisters, these are just general rules inshallah. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to exercise every day, all the time. He always moved, even the way he walked. He would walk with long strides. And when I said speed walking, he didn't speed walk, but he walked fast. So always heading towards a goal. When you see him walking, he's headed. He's busy. He's long strides, going towards his goals, not slouching and lazy. And lastly, movement and activity. Energy, brothers and sisters. You decide to move. You decide to have energy. You know, there's no such thing as less or longer sleep. Sleep earlier, it's better for you. And even if in the day you have a little qaylula, a siesta, that's nice, it's from the sunnah. Um, and the truth is there's no agreed hour of sleep for adults. Uh, the activity is your decision and laziness is your decision. For example, as I said before, wake up tomorrow, inshallah, tomorrow, Thursday morning, and say to yourself, today I am deciding to be active and energetic. Will you try that for me tomorrow, inshallah? I've got some of my students here from school. Will you try that for us tomorrow? Okay, I'm some of your coordinator. I'm going to be walking into the cor corridor tomorrow. You tens, I'm going to watch. I'm going to ask you, did you say in the mirror today, I will be energetic and active today? So inshallah, make that decision and watch what happens. You can even say, today I'm going to help my mum. I'm going to help my dad. Today I'm going to smile. Today I'm going to do good things. Today I'm not going to get angry. Wallahi, it works. My brothers and sisters, that concludes my talk. I hope inshallah, look, it's a lot of information. But if you take... And subhanAllah, I've said it a few times, take notes. Alhamdulillah, we still don't take notes. I should have put it here, take notes. But <clears throat> if you've taken a few of this, inshallah, it's recorded, it's going to be on YouTube, inshallah. Um, also on the mosque's uh, Facebook website. Um, if you take one or two things from this, inshallah, it'll make a huge difference in your life. You don't have to take everything. I can't, you can't. But take some of it, inshallah. Any of it, any of it, wallahi. Inshallah, will improve you. And remember... It's not about having worldly things. You are working for your hereafter. Have sincerity. Know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember to monitor halal from haram. Whatever you do, think, is that going to benefit me in my hereafter or not? And remember that earning money and, and doing things even for worldly gain is not, is not uh, bad. It's beneficial and it could be fi sabilillah to help your family, to help yourself, to develop yourself, to contribute. All this, if you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is fi sabilillah insha'Allah. So a Muslim makes their ultimate goal Jannah and to be safe from hellfire. So let us be insha'Allah productive, energetic, motivated, 
uh, people who develop and make goals for themselves and please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all our avenues in life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Wa sallallahu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.